in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Dustin Melbarnes, Lizzie Haynes, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable, the podcast where we watch movies and talk about them. I'm your host, Chad Robinson, and joining me today is my good friend and co-host, Lizzie Haynes. Lizzie, how are you doing? I'm well, excited for tonight's movie. Absolutely. We get spooky season in March or whenever this re- releases, April, and that is coming to us from across the pond, Dudley, England. Man with an absolutely massive movie collection. He will put you to shame. And his written reviews, amazing as well. Dan Cook, welcome back. Oh, that's very kind of you. Hi there. How are you both? You okay? Good, good. So excited for uh, for tonight. Yes, thank you so much for having me back. It was a lot of fun uh, the last time I did this. So uh, I'm looking forward to doing this again. Absolutely. Yeah, and we will we'll st- jump right into our warm-ups, but uh, we'll dip allow Dan some promotion time too because he's got a lot going on just so our viewers if they didn't hear you before we'll we'll learn a little about you now so Dan we'll start with you what's a horror movie that did not get a sequel but you wish it had Hmm, that's a good question I mean one of my favorite horror films is Black Christmas from 1974 it's a good one but I'm sort of glad they didn't give that a sequel because it doesn't it doesn't really need one the remakes Um, I mean there are plenty of Thank you. Oh, what was that? I said the remakes are terrible. Uh, I like the 2006 film. I like that's that film. that's fair. The 2022 one though. Yeah, the uh, the, uh, the 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 recent one, the 2019 one was pretty damn dreadful. Yeah. yeah. The 2006 yeah. one honestly gave me like I had like trauma from that. I like the cookies in the back, like the cookie cutter. That really. Got me. I was in college when I watched that, and it haunted me for a while. I had to have a nightlight for a minute because of that movie. Wow. Well, I, I have a real thing about eyes getting damaged in horror films, and we'll we'll talk about that when we talk about uh, Halloween three. Um, yes. But there's a lot of eye eye t- trauma in a, in the 20, uh, 2006 Black Christmas. Um, I can't really. Th- I can think of many films that I wish didn't have a sequel, like yes. uh, Jaws. Um, Let's see, a horror film that I would love to get a sequel to. Halloween 3 Season of the Witch? In terms mm. of, like, I'd like another anthology film. Um, yeah, I can't, I don't really have an answer for that. Um, I'll probably I'll probably think of one in a minute, but off the top of my head, um, I think we could probably do with less sequels and more original stuff. Babadook, I'm, Babadook, maybe. I'd love I'm to see the continuation of that. Well, that's a good movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that'd be an interesting sequel. Deal with a different aspect instead of mm-hmm. uh, grief or depression. Deal with something else. Yeah, I, I'm for it. Lizzie? This is really you? hard to yeah. to Dan's point. I mean, because honestly, horror in and of itself, I know it could be like any movie, but specifically thinking about horror movies, they sequels are so common. So it was really, really challenging to think about. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went ahead and settled for the sixth sense because, you know, it ends right when we find out that Bruce Willis's character is dead. And I'm like, well, what would happen next? Like, what's what's his what's his mission so that he can get sent to the other side? Perhaps what is um, that sweet little boy going to do to help him out? And besides just help him realize that he's dead. Spoiler alert. Um, but that's. Oh, well, I'm not watching that. film. <laughs> I know we're not to do we're not supposed to do spoilers, but I mean that movie is like what like twenty something years old. So at yeah. this at this point, if you don't know that spoiler, then you know that is yeah, sorry. it's well into the cultural zeitgeist. Yes, if if you did not know that, that's just on you. <laughs> Great. I, I trend toward the Dan opinion of please stop making sequels to things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So many of them, even though I'm a big Freddy guy, there there's a lot of trash in sequels. I am sad we didn't get Happy Death Day 3. COVID shut that down. So Happy Death Day 
three, love that franchise. But I think for me, if we're going on something that absolutely has not gotten a sequel, Trick or Treat. Yes. Um, 2009 with Sam. Sam oh, blew up. 2007, I thought. The, the Michael Doherty film with uh, Sam might, the Pumpkin might, Kid, yeah. It might be, yeah. yeah. Somewhere, somewhere in the late 2000s. Mm-hmm. And Sam has blown up. Like, you see him everywhere now. He's just become one of these horror mascots. And that's an anthology film. You can do that kind of like the VHS franchises. That's not a great example of things getting sequels, but you, know, <laughs> it, you can tell interesting stories. And I do love Trick or Treat. Trick or Treat would be great. In the same director as well, Krampus. I'd love a second Krampus oh, film. As well. Krampus yes. would be great. Yeah, see what happens. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, that is a yearly Christmas watch. Yes. Okay. Dan, what are the last seven movies you've watched this le- this week? Oh, well, um, <laughs> over, this, uh, over March, I like to do something called Monster March because I love Halloween so much and I, I hate that it only comes once a year. I also love monster movies. So I spend the entire month of March um, watching monster movies of all, of all sorts. I love that. So I watch, I watch the, old, the old Universal films. I watch rubbish made for TV films so if i quickly look on my letterbox i have recently watched uh cloverfields was my most recent film that was a rewatch um i watched a great irish horror film called isolation which is about um Mm. uh, genetics on a cow farm goes very very wrong and unleashes a bunch of parasites it's got essie davis from um the babadook as well so she's really good nice uh beast with idris elba uh jurassic world um for people who know it, there's a film called Baysmore from 2000, which is a French film. It's not. It's not a monster film. This is going back into into February, but it's um, it's <laughs> basically it's a film that's either art or pornography, basically. Mm, so okay. yeah, the, the, the debate still rages about that. Um, and then Asteroid City by Wes Anderson. So I've watched I've watched a, a load of different stuff recently, and uh, I'm watching another one tonight, which is probably not going to be very good with uh, Keanu Reeves called 47 Vonin. Which is like a martial arts dragon film. So right, uh, my heart's on fire. <laughs> it's enjoyable nice. as well. I don't think too hard, but it's no, fine. I don't plan to. <laughs> <laughs> Lizzie, what's the last movie that you saw? Randomly, my husband and I were winding down for the night, and we were doing that typical scroll when we don't know what to watch, and we watched Fear with Mark Wahlberg and Wahlberg. Reese Witherspoon. And that is such a great movie. And I have so many inside jokes with my friends of like the pounding on the chest (laughs) and never ceases to make me laugh. It's just so perfect. It's honestly a 10 out of 10, like teen thriller. It's Mm -hmm. just so good. Hmm. Okay. I, that is one I have not seen. So it's good. You got to check it out. You'll you'll get this reference once you start watching. Mm-hmm. Mark Wahlberg's <laughs> absolutely terrifying in that film. <laughs> he really is. He really yeah. is, and it's it's so good. Reese Witherspoon is just so adorable. I think that was before she did Cruel Intentions. I could be wrong about that. She just looks so young, and um, but I it might have been around the same time. She just looks so 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 young. Am I and, right thinking that was directed by Bill Paxton? You know what? I don't know. I'd have to look that up. I know we did a film. Oh, that might have been Frailty, actually. I might be thinking of Frailty. That, that was definitely Frailty. We covered that yeah, one. Yeah, that, that was Bill Paxton. Great Getting my movie. F movies wrong. Chad, you should <laughs> check out Fear. It's worth it. It All is right. good. I mean, you don't have to tell me twice to check out. <laughs> it's a horror movie, right? You said teen horror? Yes. You know, uh, Sarah might actually like it as well, because it's not, there's like a couple of violent scenes, but for the most part, it's it's kind of you know benign in terms of like its mm-hmm. scariness it's more thrilling than anything okay. else so i think that the two of you might enjoy watching it together fair enough I, she owes me a couple we have been on a romantic comedy kick i watch the horror movies upstairs just in my room in isolation <laughs> uh, but we are going to be spending a weird amount of time talking about the irish so i had to go and watch an irish horror movie and i went to 2020's caveat and that is a very unique movie. They have this terrifying rabbit toy that drums in the presence of spirits, which you wouldn't think would be that scary. But yeah, that's it's one where I'm not entering the house under the premise that they have for this movie. There's a lot of caveats, I guess, of 
hey, you've got to do this. Hey, you've got to do this to stay here. And condition two, I'm out. But I'm glad they stay because the movie's a lot of fun. So definitely. Added to my list. I'm surprised by that. You were saying when we watched House of the Devil, you were like, yeah, I'll stay. Like, I'll stay at the house. Like, I, it's fine. I'll babysit. Yes. <laughs> yes. I was fine with House of the Devil. Yes. Yeah. Brian and I were like, no, we're out. Like, we're not, we're not staying. Yeah. Everyone has their limits. This is my limit. And there are movies that play on that, like Speak No Evil. Mm-hmm. That, that is very much of how much can you get by with don't watch that movie lizzie that is i won't i won't yeah i i believe you and i trust you to know what what my That's, limit is so i will not watch it that is not a lizzie it's weird before, before i had kids i didn't think i had a limit and then yeah. have now having two daughters it my my tolerance for especially horror aimed at kids has gone drastically down my wife and i went to go and see a quiet place part two in the cinema mm-hmm. and we almost had to leave because oh. she was she was just so freaked out by that scene where the kids are trapped in that little um mm. what's it called like uh like tanker thing yes and it's, yes that's on them she got really really upset at that oh. so uh yeah <laughs> does it change no. a bit. i completely agree with you it's hard human suffering has always been hard for me to mm-hmm. watch but particularly now as a mom it's it's really hard i have it's to really tough. i have to bow out of those movies that are just too gory and too sad yeah, yeah. Yeah, The Walking Dead uh, was about the same time as I had my daughter, and they introduced a baby to the show, and I'm just like, you know what? Yeah. I'm done. Mm -hmm. I'm done for a while. So before we introduce the movie we're talking about today, Dan, tell us a little bit about your adventures, where we can find you, read about you. Oh, well, if you want to read any of my reviews, especially for the film we're about to review tonight, you can go to Dan Cook Movie Reviews on Facebook. I'm on there. And I've also, I'm also on Letterboxd. I, I used to do this thing where I would review every single movie I watched. Um, but then it became not so fun because I'd have to try and find things to say about really terrible films. But also it also cut down the amount of films that I could watch, you know, because I'd, I'd have this idea that I couldn't watch anything until I'd written a full review for the film that I just talked about. So I don't review as much, but you can still check my... Uh, my watch list and things on there on Letterbox at uh, Dan Cook Twenty One, um, but most my reviews mostly are on Facebook at uh, at Dan Cook Movie Reviews. If you'd like to go there. And when you say you do reviews, it's not a hey, this movie was fun and funny and no, made me smile. It's, it's it is a very well written, very oh, well, well critiqued. I do, I do love, I do love writing. And with the Oscars coming up, I've been seeing a lot of the uh, the best picture nominees and things, and really trying to dig deep into those films rather than just going you know yeah it's good yeah it's bad you know because you can find that anywhere i like to uh because i love film you know i love i love talking about it in any kind of sense so give me give me a film and i'll talk about it like the film we're going to talk about uh tonight lots of things to talk about so yes and lizzie what film are we going to talk about tonight we are going to talk about arguably the most um argued over film in the Halloween franchise, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Yes, from 1982. This stars Tom Adkins, Stacey Nelkin, Dan O'Hurley, Michael Curry, and Ralph Strait. It's got a $4.6 million budget. It makes 14.4 domestically. That puts it at number 53, disappointing for a Halloween franchise. Secret of Nim comes in right before it, and Diner is right after it. Number one movie, which we have covered, E.T., The Extraterrestrial. Check that out. That's a very early episode, episode 41. We're in the 200s now. IMDb, this gives it a 5.1. Here comes the things that Lizzie's talking about. Rotten Tomatoes. Critics, half and half, 50%. Audience score, much, much, much worse, 28%. It does win a Saturn Award or at least it's nominated for one, for Best Poster Art. That's all you get, Best <laughs> Poster Art. Ed, Ed R- Rivera, good job on that poster. It does have the distinction, however, of making Roger Ebert's most hated movies list. He has not removed it. Roger Ebert hates this movie. Dan, you shortlisted this movie, and I got to be honest, 
I didn't even get the shortlist. I didn't get a choice. It was just all of a sudden, Russell texts me. Russell does all this wonderful organization. Give Russell a shout out on Facebook. He does so much work. But Russell says, Chad, you're doing Season of the Witch. <laughs> cool. Cool. So, so, Dan, you said you have written a review about this. Yeah. I skipped the seen this movie before, but what are you expecting to get out of this episode? What are you expecting to get out of revisiting this movie this time around? Well, it's an interesting film because it is so divisive. You know, ever since it was released in 82, it's a film that can cause a lot of arguments between fans of the Halloween franchise. And obviously, I don't know where you two fall fall on the uh, on that the opinion. I've always loved it. And every Halloween, every time Halloween comes around, I always recommend it to people and say, you know, if you want to see a really, really underrated film, because I think it's possibly the most underrated horror film of the 80s. Um, and I always say to people, you know, just know it's very different to anything else the Halloween franchise did. Um, and I love it for that. But I can completely understand why people would hate it. You know, it, it, it does everything that a sequel shouldn't do. Um, and um, I really admire it for that. So I'm, I'm interested to see how, if the if that divisive nature has mellowed over the years or if it is still as fierce as it was back in, in 1982. Lizzie, how about you? So, uh, Chad, I was telling you earlier, I, I was listening to this podcast of this woman. I wish I could give her a shout out. I cannot remember the name of it, but it was right around the time that Danny McBride's Holly, uh, Halloween was about to come out. And so it was just going over the genesis of Halloween and how it's evolved over the years. And I had never explored Halloween past. I had seen Halloween one, two, and then I skipped all the other sequels. And then I went right to the Rob Zombie ones when I was mm. really studying Halloween. <laughs> and uh, which I, which I know is like going to get my like horror card revoked, but I, so it wasn't until I was probably 28 that I decided I was going to sit down and watch Halloween 3. So it must have been about seven years ago. And I love it. Like, I, I understand why it's so, like, such a heavily debated movie. I really do because I appreciate that the absence of Michael Myers is such a huge issue to a lot of people. But in the same way that Halloween ends, and I won't spoil that movie, the very last movie of the franchise, I actually liked that movie as well. I don't think that it fit in in the Michael Myers universe, mm -hmm. but if you took that out and just made it its own unique film, I think it really stands strong on its own, and I really, really feel the same, even more so, about Halloween 3. I just think it's, it's so campy and fun, and the story's great, and I just have a great time watching it. And I almost think it... I mean, it's probably one of my favorite Halloween films, if I'm being mm -hmm. completely honest. It's fair. And this movie has developed kind of a cult following. There's been a push to get this movie more recognition. I have been one of those that goes to bat for this movie. I've had many arguments with Russell of its value and its worth. I'll be honest, though, when I revisited this movie, I see Russell's point. I see other people's point. I have a very high tolerance for 80s camp. It's charming to me. But objectively i think this is a bad movie i think it's a bad movie oh, no but it's a bad yeah. movie that i really enjoy that i think i will still continue recommending i like the boldness i like the risks it takes we just talked about it earlier and this is going to sound like a complete contradiction but i like that kids aren't safe in this mm -hmm. movie like we're not doing it for necessarily shock factor but nobody's safe it may not really make sense in the plot, but I I like the boldness here where we have, instead of the fake outs that we get in the later Halloweens where Michael stops at the baby, the baby carriage and then just walks away. Like I don't want him to necessarily kill that kid, but at the same time, you don't really need that shot. I, yeah. It doesn't work for me. Like if, if that's not his thing, he's either pure evil or he isn't. So, with that being said, this is going to be a fascinating episode to talk about. I can't wait to get into it, but we are going to take an ad break. We will be back in just a few seconds for Lizzie to somehow try and tell us what happened <laughs> in this movie. We'll be right back. Welcome to the All 80s Movies Podcast. I'm Bill. 
And I'm Jason, and this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies, the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi, we've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we're finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we'll discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. It's the All 80s Movies Podcast, now available on all major streaming platforms. Please subscribe and happy listening. And we're back. I really do think this is going to be my favorite plot summary. At oh, least gosh. <laughs> my favorite plot summary that I've been on. Lizzie, good luck to you. Take it away. All right. A man runs away in a panic, being seemingly chased by some calm gentlemen in suits. He's taken to the hospital after being found by a good Samaritan. And it's there that Dr. Daniel Chalice hears this man's panicked warning that they're going to kill us while clutching a silver shamrock mask. Before he can wake up from his nap, Daniel hears a nurse screaming as the same man has been killed. Daniel's interest in this man, why he was so afraid, and his attractive daughter, Ellie, have piqued his interest into solving the mystery of what happened that night. They head to the Silver Shamrock Warehouse, a brand that has been showing commercials and selling masks around every corner advertising for a big event on Halloween night at 9 p.m. The two head to the small town, it begins and ends with the same Silver Shamrock factory, all run by Mr. Cochran. Things go from strange to full-on suspicious after a supplier from San Francisco is secretly taken away, and Daniel overhears that there was a misfire. Daniel and Ellie follow another supplier with his wife and child into the factory for a tour. There, Daniel witnesses the horrific death of, a young, of the young child wearing the mask as a test. Daniel is met by Cochran, where he confesses that this is all a sacrificial ritual of which Halloween, as we know, is loosely based. Daniel manages to barely escape using Shamrock's own devices against them. He calls the police in a panic as the clock strikes nine and the silver Shamrock commercial plays. <laughs> Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! <laughs> all right, so that... Uh... That is fantastic and somehow still doesn't touch on the insanity of right. this movie. It's very <laughs> thorough. But let's get this out of the way. We touched on it a little bit before the ad break. There's no Michael Myers in this movie. It has Halloween 3 attached to it. Aside from the television showing their original Halloween, John Carpenter famously did not want Michael Myers to be a franchise. He wanted to do a Halloween trilogy. Studio interference got us halloween 2 and john carpenter says i definitively killed him and loomis he's he's dead he's not coming back and so he gets to make the third movie in his trilogy dan do you think not having michael myers hurts the opinion on halloween 3 and do you think it lives up to a halloween name i think it's 99 percent of the reason why people hate the film to be honest um it'll be like for example my favorite film's jaws and Steven Spielberg makes a sequel and it's about a whale, you know, or a stingray <laughs> or something. That's a good, that's a good comparison. Well, it's the star Troll of the too. franchise, you know, when you, it was very, it was, a, it was a very, very foolish thing to do. I mean, as much as I love the film, I completely recognize that why would you make a sequel to, a, well, give it the name of a, a film that people love um, and not include it's, it's the star attraction. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, it, it was a, I will never understand why, uh, John Carpenter and director Tommy Lee Wallace went through with that idea because it was a huge mistake. I mean, the film bombed spectacularly and it was it was a critical failure. And, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, it's still divisive to this day. I just think it was a gamble that really paid off. Um, maybe not in the, you know, at the time, but I think it's now seen as a really underrated horror film. Um, but yeah, I, I have no idea what John Carpenter was thinking because if he wanted to do, you know, a series of films about around Halloween, why did he do Halloween two? <laughs> you know, the, the, fir the first Halloween ended perfectly with Jamie Lee Curtis crying and that, that image of Michael Myers gone off the, off the lawn. He could have just ended there and then just gone into all the other sorts of Halloween stories like a, uh, 
a more horrific version of, of nearly said Goosebumps, of The Twilight Zone or something. Um, and I think that's what this film reminds me of the most is an episode of The Twilight Zone or something like that, especially mm. its ending. It's like, um, yeah, I, I, uh, it baffles me to this day why, why John Carpenter <laughs> had this idea. I'm glad he did. But uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> he's an odd guy, that John Carpenter. But I do love him. Is that what catch, kept you away from the movie, Lizzie? Like you heard the third one doesn't have Michael Myers, so why bother? I think I always just I I think that one and then I I'm just really now in my in my 30s really starting to appreciate camp in a way that I didn't before. And so I think, you know, and as we all know with sequels, like the higher the sequel, the campier it tends to get. And I think I got burned a little bit by a lot of the Nightmare on Elm Street sequels. You know, I really like this, the actual direct sequel, but then as it keeps going higher and higher, it's like Freddie would like kill someone and then do like a jig afterwards. And it was just mm, strange yeah. to me. And I think I just, I made a snap assumption. And now, I mean, I, as I said before, I mean, it's almost one of my favorite movies. I, so there's a, a movie franchise, The Haunting in Connecticut. I think I've talked about this before, actually, on the podcast, of the, the movie Haunting in Connecticut. And then they come out with a sequel, and it's called Haunting in Connecticut 2, comma, Ghosts in Georgia. And the movie takes place in Georgia. And yeah. it's very confusing to me. I'm like, why? Why? There's no reference to Connecticut at all. There's no connection. Totally different characters. Why, just, why don't you just call it Ghosts in Georgia? Like, I'm very confused why you need to associate it with Haunting in Connecticut. And I honestly feel the exact same way about this movie. I think it just needs to be, like, it should have been a standalone movie. I think at that time, like, John Carpenter had enough notoriety that he probably could have just done that. Um, and I do appreciate the idea of an anthology. Like, in a different universe, I would have really liked to have seen what other movies he would have come up with that have taken place on Halloween that have nothing to do with Michael Myers. I do want to see, I would love to pick his brain on what other ideas that he had. But ultimately... There's a reason why we love Michael Myers. It's just we have a fascination with this evil entity almost that we know nothing about, doesn't speak. We have no idea what his motive is. He's just this like representation of evil. Mm -hmm. And so I really do appreciate why his absence was such a big deal. But nonetheless, I it does not hurt it for me. Like I love this movie. I don't need Michael Myers to appreciate the season of The Witch. That is a great point. I I couldn't find anything in my research, and maybe it's out there, of what John Carpenter planned for a trilogy before the studio said, hey, Michael Myers made a bunch of money. Do a second one. Like, yeah. Like, do a, do another one of those. Because this, this one's really paying homage to uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Mm -hmm. It's the same city name. It kind of ends in the same way. Instead of uh, Kevin McCarthy screaming. We have Tom Atkins screaming at, at seemingly no one. There's there's replacements. I I agree. I can't imagine the bullheadedness here of I'm just going to slap on Halloween 3. Just call it Season of the Witch. Right. That, that ends the majority, although there are no witches in here. You, I guess you can't call it Season of the Irish. But like that ends the controversy of Michael Myers. There's no more no more of that. And now that they keep making Michael Myers movies around it, I want it out of this franchise even more. Yeah. Like I, def I defend it, but this one is more egregious than Friday the 13th Part 5, where it's not Jason. Like, that, that one's really bad, but at least Jason is pseudo-present in a very terrible oh, form. So yeah, cool. yeah, I, it's terrible too. Like that's that's a far worse movie. Oh right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, for me, I think. I mean, I love slasher movies. I'm a huge fan of slasher movies, and um, I recently rewatched Halloween too. And rewatching it, it made it was so embedded in the slasher genre at that time. You know, it was following all of the of the tropes that the original Halloween laid out. To the point where Halloween 2 is actually quite a boring film to me because it is so a by the number slasher film. And I think that's what John Carpenter was so worried about that it would just become so stale, um, like the Halloween series would end up becoming after part four. Um, 
but yeah, I yeah, I I love it, um, and I think I think for me personally, it's it's a film that gets better as it ages, right? Whereas the Halloween films that come came after it, and maybe even the one before it, um, they've they've aged very poorly. I think, uh, I think <laughs> Halloween three is a film where, where it's ideas such as you know surveillance and using auto uh, automatry over human. Uh, labor um i think that that's a idea that's going to be you know even more prescient as we get into a more ai age whereas the 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 traditional slashes of the michael myers um i think they'll fall by the wayside and i think that's why the halloween series decreased so quickly with the david gordon green trilogy in the eyes of the public because it was doing very little that we hadn't seen before halloween 3 does something that no one had seen before and people weren't ready for it i do like that point because to your point, I feel like Halloween 2 is experiencing kind of pushback now. You see it in rankings. It's falling. Mm -hmm. Halloween 4, I do think it's getting a better reputation. 5 and 6 are always going to be trash. <laughs> like, sorry, Paul Rudd. If I was just going to say, I can't believe Paul Rudd's in that movie. It's just like the funniest concept. Yeah, they're, they're terrible. We covered H2O. I, I'll go to bat for H2O, but mm -hmm. it was almost too pg-13 ish like they they didn't take any risks with it but it it was better than six <laughs> it was better than six was better than resurrection as well i was just gonna say resurrection to me is oh. like the ultimate worst of the yeah. worst i appreciate that perhaps they tried to be campy but in the 2000s it didn't read as camp it just was tacky i guess yeah, and it not clever it was just awful that is such a good point. Yeah, I do think this is one of those films that is is picking up steam and it's it's getting a better reputation, whereas many of these others are falling out of favor. I do want to read, this is my favorite review of this movie. It's from Vincent Camby of the New York Times. He says, Halloween 3 manages the not easy feat of being anti-children, anti-capitalism, anti-television and anti-irish all at the same wow. time <laughs> he, he does wow. go on to say that it is probably as good as any cheerful ghoul could ask for Let, let's talk about this plot that lizzie went over like this entire film is kind of nuts Irish cult steals part of Stonehenge, <laughs> brings it back. Very easy yeah. to steal. Super easy to steal. Super easy to import back to America. <laughs> then they start a toy factory ultimately meant to be used to sacrifice children, all while slowly replacing adults with androids. I mean, <laughs> what, what is working here for you? And is there some point where you're like, this is a bridge too far. Did you need all of these plot points? <laughs> oh, man. I, I think what works for me is I actually really like Daniel Chalice. I find him, he's not a perfect character. He's he's flawed. I mean, you look at the relationship that he has with his ex-wife and that like really hard dynamic that the two of them have together. She is awful. She was really hard on him. Oh my gosh, she went at the towards the very end of the movie. We're like, just listen to me, just listen to me. But he's probably earned some of that, um, some some of that attitude from from her is what something that I've gathered. But I, I do. But at the end of the day, I think he is a character that has. I wouldn't necessarily go as far to say he's a great guy, but you can kind of tell he's just like an average guy that's really trying to do better is probably a, a good way to describe him. No, a great guy asked the girl's age the first time. Right, he right. With her, not the second. <laughs> that line, by the way, that line that she says, which I'm sure we'll get to. At a, I, that, that, I'm still scratching my head over her Old response. Enough. <laughs> Stop. That does like, not... wait, what is this a riddle like i don't understand just tell right. me how old you are and um so yes so but i i like i just like how it feels fun it's like you're on a little adventure you don't take it too seriously um and i i kind of agree i like the risks that it takes with kids being you know i agree like we've been through the whole um portion earlier in the episode talking about how we feel about children and we want to protect them and I 
you know, obviously there's this like very intense scene that again, I'm sure we will get to, but I do appreciate that they make it so incredibly campy that it almost removes that, yeah. that kind of heartache that would be out of it. And, you know, cause you're looking at some of this newer stuff, like Rob Zombie movies, like those are too hard for me to watch, but this movie is just nice and easy and so it's cozy horror. It's really the best way to describe it. It's cozy horror. You want to just curl up with a blanket and a hot cup of cocoa and watch Season of the Witch. It's just a nice, fun horror movie. Dan, are there any plot points for this where you're like, really? We're doing this too? <laughs> or are you just, are you like Lizzie? Curl up with that blanket and say, sure, why not? Go steal monuments. The, the bonk, <laughs> more bonkers, the better, in my opinion. It's, it, as I said earlier, it's something you have never seen before. You know, it's just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. You know, and I, I like that. It's a film that goes for both. Saying, you know, if, we, if we're going to go, we're going to, you know, deviate from the Michael Myers path. Let's go as far as possible <laughs> with this. Um, and I like that. Yeah, not all of it makes sense. I mean, OK, 90 percent of it doesn't make sense. <laughs> but that, that's what I like about it. It's a film that's got its own weird mythology to it. You know, it's a film that can be looked at and, you know, saying, well, so how does that work and how does that work? And trying to piece it together a, like a mystery, like Daniel Chalice is in the film. You know, you're trying to work out the mechanics of this as he is. And even at the end, you're like, OK, so what actually was this about? You know, right. was this just a massive joke on the part of Connell Cochran? You know, what what were his motivations? Or was he just trying to keep alive an old tradition that he he really cared about or does he just not like kids you know <laughs> what, what, what's, the, what's the end game here um and i like that i like i like a villain who's so you know yeah you've got hannibal lecter and even somebody like freddy krueger or the joker you know they've got a real path of evil that they want to follow this guy is just thinking why the hell not you know no one yeah. else, no one else is right. i might as well do it he nice. knows when he's been bested too. Like when towards the end of the movie, when he realizes like his number is up, you know, he almost is accepting, I would say, you know, he looks right at Daniel and he kind of, he, he claps and, and applause for him. And I, so I, th I think you're absolutely right. He's just kind of, it's like an anarchist almost. He's just like, sure. Like, let's just, let's just see what happens and watch them squirm. Yeah. It's a game. It's just a game to him. And that's what I love. As you say, that clap at the end, he knows that he's won. He's basically yeah. done a John Doe in seven. You know, if you kill me, I've won. So, yes. you know, that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it for him. He accomplishes his goal. He just wouldn't have been around to see it. Yeah, you know? That's a theme that sticks throughout the movie that they're trying to make it more of a practical joke. Mm -hmm. So all, all throughout the gore effects. Although I'm not sure I agree with some of them. It actually caused one of our, I think it was a screenwriter, to demand that their name be removed from the movie because they thought it was too gory and it was too violent. Mm -hmm. uh, Lizzie, you brought up our hero, Dr. Chalice. This is a strange one for me with Tom Atkins. He's a doctor. And doctor is a medical expert. And he goes on an investigation of a cult. <laughs> this, is, this is one of many plot points that probably doesn't make sense. I'll be honest, when I look at Tom Adkins, I'm like, that dude is not a doctor. We need to cast him as a cop, an investigator. Like, that's the vibe he's giving me. I do not trust him. If that's my doctor walking in with a clipboard, I'm saying, no, <laughs> get out. Yeah. Get out. Go find He's some quite people. a ladies' man. And yeah. um, it could have really been anybody. He could have had any profession. There could have been any circumstance where he was introduced to Ellie's dad and didn't necessarily have to be in a hospital. Yeah. yeah, he could have had the same time constraints as a cop, as a investigator. You keep weird hours. You have to work odd jobs. But they chose doctor, I guess, just because we've got to have the dude with the mask in the hospital and killing him yeah. there. So, and more women said, to interact with. That's mm, fair. Yes. yes. You know, I mean, who doesn't want to go on an adventure with a woman, you know, with a load of beer and try and solve a mystery while you could have been at home with your kids on Halloween nights? <laughs> you know? Oh my gosh. Yeah. That... I couldn't imagine getting that phone call. Like, I really, really need to just see this through. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you will see that my locks, that the locks have been changed when you come home, sir. Yes. <laughs> what do you mean you can't spend time with your kids? Oh, I'm out with this young woman that I've only... Yeah. 
I've got some beer with me, and we're going to go out on the road. You I know. don't know how old she is. We'll see. Right. Happy Halloween. <laughs> that, Tell that the kids question. I guess I love them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't really make acknowledge. I guess he tries to call his wife at the end and get them away from the TV or like not have that interaction. And I'm sure that's on his mind, but we don't really see that emotional connection with kids or anything like that. Yeah, he, the first attractive maybe of age maybe not we're in the <laughs> 80s so devil may care attitude until at least the second time i think which... i think that's deliberate because if if he really did have a good relationship with his kids that would make that ending not fun that would make that ending really sad and tragic mm. um i think i think it dampens the i mean the fact that the kid who does get killed buddy is an annoying little git. yes you know that doesn't that it doesn't matter that he dies, but the fact that sounds awful. But you know what I mean. <laughs> well, I, yes, yes. If, if, it, if, yes. if Daniel Chalice's two kids have been really lovely kids, and you really got to know them, and knew what they liked, and that we're really looking forward to the Halloween season, and then you realise at the end, oh, they they carked it as well. That would be that would make that would give the ending a really sour note, rather than a really funny like, oh, what, what happened at the end? You know, did it actually go down the way Connor Cochran planned it? Uh, I so I think that is deliberate, just so it sort of smooths the edges off that ending, which is admittedly a horrible ending anyway. Um, yeah. But I think that would make it sad rather than like, oh, that was a, a mean thing to do. That's a yeah, good you, point. Yeah. We've got E.T. in the same year. You can't have Drew Barrymore being cute, adorable Drew Barrymore and then have that ending, which, by the way, I this probably speaks volumes about the type of person I am. I had no idea this was considered an ambiguous ending. I, mm -hmm. from the first time I watched this, I was like, there's thousands of dead kids. We just killed a bunch of kids. And yeah, nope. I I had no idea that this was presented as happy or open. I would like to think that it's open ended just because of the, of the kid element. But I do agree when you really apply logic, it's like the, the kids are all wearing the mask. It's nine o'clock. Like there's, it's, it's happened. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's fun to, to guess but ultimately like we know the facts and the facts are that there are tons of snakes <laughs> and yes. spiders and bugs going out of those kids now and it's very sub I but Dan I think that's like I never thought about that but that's a really really good point like you they almost like dehumanize his family yeah in a way like they're almost shadows in the movie because of that exact fact like it would be really really hard to come to terms with the fact that his his kids have died of this horrific death yeah it's a really really good point well in the novelization of the book that came out about a year later i think um it says that one of the final lines is and the air was filled with the screams of crying mothers yes oh my gosh yes that's, so, that's the original uh, in, in yeah. credits too they had children screaming as the end credits were going but yeah, they thought they that, had was, to cut that. that was a bridge yeah. too far there were that was the only alternate ending because Tom Atkins said he didn't know how this movie ended. He had an interview with the Pittsburgh press and they shot several different endings and that's the darkest one. And so he's come out. It's not canon, but he said the kids live. They, they shut off the commercial. I think that's the happy fluffy. Yeah. We're, we're all here saying no, no, those, those kids yeah. do not make it. That's interesting though, that everyone's no, this is, this is definitive. Those kids are gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I think it would be it would there would need to be some kind of explanation as to how they were able to shut everything off mm -hmm. and um in order for it to really ring true. And I don't like the idea that there's thousands of 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 children that have, you know, come to this whole, like succumb to this horrific fate, but I as a horror movie at the same time like I, I want to appreciate the story and give it the ending that it deserves. And I think that that is the ending that you need to follow through. If that's what you're going to choose, you need to choose your choice and yep. really end there. And so I think they did a good job with letting that ending go. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, I think also the fact that it was going to be part of an anthology, you know, it just ends it definitively there. Like that's the sting in the tail. You know, this is as I was comparing it to Twilight Zone earlier. You know, it's it's got that yes. horrible, it's got that horrible ending. You know, that's a a nice little horror package for us to enjoy. Let's see what the next one brings along. You know, it gives gives it compartmentalizes them into their own stories rather than making them sequel bait. Um, so I, I like the fact that the ending is so dark. 
because it puts a definitive closure on closure on that story. You know, yep. I, I can't imagine that the follow the, the the sequels, well, the anthology sequels, would have referenced the events of Santa Mir and Connell Cochran whatsoever, because it it wouldn't make sense when you saw kids running around. You think, oh, you should be dead. Right. It's very true. Yeah. Um, but uh, obviously, it wasn't meant to be. Um, but as you said, Lizzie, I'd love to have picked uh, John Carpenter's brains and see what other ideas he had, and yes, see if they, yes. if they would have tied into this. Um, or not. I personally wouldn't think it it would need to. But uh, yeah, by ending it that way, it really does put a full stop to saying, nope, that's the end of Halloween 3. You know, nothing else (laughs) is going to come after this. Whatever's next is a new and fresh story. Let's talk about Connell Cochran. This is our big villain. He is just, Dan kind of touched on it. He just kind of does this for the last, for the fun of it. There's this Irish cult backstory that's really neither here nor there. Uh, I think the original idea was he's a 5,000 year old demon. I, I'm kind of intrigued uh, by that idea. Uh, you've got your own cult. Instead, he's just got a toy factory cult. Dan O'Hurley, he, he said uh, he enjoyed it. He had so much fun doing this movie, but he saw the final product and he's like, yeah, the movie's not very good, but I had a great time doing it. What did you think of the job that he did for Connell Cochran? I think I think he did a great job. I I find he's your first impression of him, he's such a gentleman and you you know, you know any anybody that understands the formula of horror movies, you know that he's not a good guy. <laughs> but nonetheless, you appreciate that he's such a gentleman because for me, I love a good juxtaposition. Like I love a charming villain to me. I want to have that internal struggle where I know you're bad, but somehow I enjoy what I, I like watching you on my screen. And somehow that kind of darker side of me finds myself rooting for you. I love villains like that to me. It just makes the movie so much more rich and complex. And I, I see that a lot with, with Mr. Cockle, with Connor Co- Colonel Cochran. I find that he is, uh, he's such a gentleman. He's so charming. He lures you in. He wants you to feel welcome in his town. And, and even when everything is said and done, like when he's, you know, trying to, he, at, the, at this point, Daniel is tied up and he's about to put a mask on him and play the commercial so that he'll succumb to the same fate. He's so calm. Like he just remains so cool, calm and collected. And there's even when he knows he's about to die, he stays so cool, calm and collected. And I find that so intriguing. It's this, where does that come from? And I think Dan, it honestly speaks to what you were saying of like, I just don't think he really cares that much. I think that he just wants to watch people squirm and suffer. And there's not really anything in it for him other than it's fun for him. Like it's just a game, like you said. So win or lose, he's having a good time and he's he's fine with whatever outcome so i it's like an apathy that is definitely scary but fun to watch some men just like to watch the world burn yeah that's (laughs) connell cochran yep then are you having a good time along with connell cochran he's one of my absolute favorite movie villains he does he does the things that my absolute favorite villains do he doesn't raise his voice at all in the film he doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't give out big displays of emotion. It's just a very understated psychopathy. And there's, there's a great moment where um, Dan, Dan Chalice and Ellie find her, her dad's car in the garage of the, uh, of the Silver Shamrock facility. And he turns to Buddy, the, uh, the customer who he's got going on the tour, and he says, oh, trade secrets, you know. And he just gives this look, and his face changes only by millimeters. And it's the face of like, I'm going to kill that. <laughs> you know, he doesn't need to say it. It's just in his eyes and in his expression and the way he holds himself. It's a very understated form of complete evil. And I love villains like that. My favorite Disney film is The Hunchback of Notre Dame. And he reminds me a lot, actually, of the villain in that, who is a yes. uh, Rolo. Because he, in that film, is, you know, he's a very dignified guy. He's got a very, you know, deep, resonant voice. And he seems like he could be everyone's uncle. Um, but he also seems like he could kill you with, you know, with the snap of his fingers. He's got, he's got a power that no one could possibly understand. And he's got intentions that are so much darker than anyone would have expected of a guy who runs a toy factory. I, I think, I think he's a, it's a brilliant performance by Dan O'Hurley. 
And it's, um, yeah, as I said, it's one of my all-time favorite villainous performances because there's nothing about him which says, except for the dialogue, which says he is an evil man who's going to kill millions of kids on Halloween <laughs> night. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think it's brilliant. Brilliant performance. It's funny you mentioned Hunchback because that, that was our flu game. Liz, Lizzie and I were both yes. sick for that, but we did just cover that. And we so did, that episode yep. probably will be coming out shortly. It hasn't been released at this time, but Minister Furlow is, he's hes one of my favorite Disney villains mm-hmm. just because he's so evil and manipulative. I mean, he seemingly treats Quasimodo well. He says nice things while completely just gaslighting him. It's its a different type of villain. Well, it, the thing with Folo is not to deviate too far from Halloween 3, is the fact that he, he thinks what he's doing is right. Yes. In his eyes, he's not an evil man. He's a very righteous man, you know, as he sings in the song Hellfire. He he thinks he's doing right by God. So he mm. what he does can be excused by the fact that he's working under the veil of religion, whereas Connell Cochran is doing it because everything's a big laugh to him. You yeah. know, but also he's respecting his... Irish ancestors by completing the ritual that needs to be completed for sound purposes or whatever he wants to call it. Yeah. yeah, he his conversations with Dr. Chalice are very interesting because it is. Uh, Lizzie talked about it earlier of why wouldn't I do this? Mm-hmm. Why why wouldn't I why wouldn't evil exist? You know, I don't need a reason. He unfortunately then gives him a reason. I hate that part of the line. It's like, just stick there and then it would be so much worse. That's so much more terrifying that somebody's just evil for the sake of it. Yeah, when he says, yeah. when he says it's the best joke of all, a joke on the children. No, the yeah. fact that he's targeting his, you know, the people he's trying to make happy, you know, the, the youngest and the most vulnerable in society. And he's saying, these are the ones I'm getting. These are the ones that I'm really got it in for, <laughs> you know. It's just yeah. it's it's so twisted. But as I say, he never raises his voice. He never does anything outwardly evil, except to give a stare or you know say something you know in a rather monotone, sinister way. He's not he's not a villain outwardly, but inwardly, he's rotten to the core, <laughs> you know, yes. and loving every second of it. Yes. And, and be honest, since you've watched this movie. That jingle stuck in your head, right? One hundred percent. Yes. It is played fourteen times during this movie, and I never got sick of it. No, nope. not once. I I talked to these guys before the podcast started. I'm an idiot. I didn't realize that it's London Bridge, it, but it's so catchy, and it's just something. Every time it came on, I would be like the kids, just bopping my head back and forth to that. The beep boop beep boop beep. Yes. Absolutely. I'm I'm right there. And they trick those kids. They're going around with vehicles with speaker phones, <laughs> megaphones. It's yeah. like if you're one of the lucky children that has these masks. Yes. So and that's Tommy's get... voice, right? Tommy Lee Wallace's yes, voice. Like yeah. now. Now wow. we got the round children. It's almost yes. yes. It is so it's so good. It's because it's so unassuming. You know, when we talked about that, we I had said that I sing London Bridge to my kids all the time and there was Chad had gotten had thought that I was singing the Silver <laughs> Shamrock song to my kids. But in all honesty, like I out of taken out of context, like I absolutely could. Like it seems very harmless. And oh. that's the that's the kind of the allure of it is this idea of it's playing to the joke, you know, because if you just sing Happy Halloween, Silver Shamrock without even knowing anything else, the kids are just going to think it's a Halloween song. Yeah, playing right into Connor Cochran's hands. Yeah, that's definitely why this movie, I think, is remembered so fondly, or at least a big part of it is that catchy song. But no, I'm absolutely not rocking my child to sleep going, Eight more days. <laughs> I will admit. <laughs> I will admit. My children haven't seen the film. My oldest is six, and my youngest is obviously they've not seen Halloween three. But yes. we have a Halloween playlist that we love to play around October time, and the 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 soundtrack to Halloween three, season of the witch is on there, including the Silver Shamrock theme. So nice. I, do, I do hear my eldest daughter going Silver Shamrock. <laughs> I feel like I've done my job as a dad. Yes. Uh, but, How uh, fun when she's older that she'll like 
she'll get the reference. You know what I mean? I think that's so fun as a kid when you're a little older and something is stuck in your head, but it kind of flew right over you. And that'll be really fun for her when she's old enough to watch it. Well, my, my, my eldest daughter's autistic and she, so she, when she fixates on something, she really fixates on something. So around Halloween time, it's her absolute favorite time of the year. So she is always going around singing Eight more days to Halloween. <laughs> 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 still looking at her like she's demented. I love it. Oh yeah, she she's um, yeah she she loves that song. She really loves that song. <laughs> that's really cute. I love that. That's, that's adorable. But yeah, the realization is going to be interesting. It's going to go one yes. of two ways of of oh cool that's where it's from or that's where that's from. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you let me listen to this? That's really yeah. funny. So John Carpenter, he he loves his people. Tom Adkins, he had been in The Fog and Escape from New York. Uh, we also have Nancy Keys. She plays Annie Brackett in the original Halloween. Oh. So, so she yeah, is Linda, Linda Chalice here. She is that awful, awful wife. She is married to Tommy Lee Wallace at the time of filming our director. Uh, Dick Warlock also shows up as an android. That's Michael Myers in Halloween 2. So he's the man behind the mask. Yep. And lastly, I don't know if you caught a very familiar voice, but Jamie Lee Curtis is the announcer for the curfew. For the curfew, yeah. Yes. She's also the telephone operator that's basically like, why are you bothering me? Go away. So John Carpenter likes his people and he brings them back constantly. There are a lot of fog references to this movie. As far as our location, we talked about it. It's Santa Mira, California. This is. It's deliberate. They chose Santa Mira because that's the town that Invasion of the Body Snatchers takes place. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a lot of bad things going on in Invasion of, or a lot of bad things going on in Santa Mira. Don't do not move to Santa Mira if you don't want to be. Don't visit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your neighbor is either an alien or an android. One way or another, they are not. They're not there for good purposes. Gas station. John Carpenter again. He uses the same one as in the fog and our I never back- picked up on that. I never no. picked up on that. He, he likes revisiting particularly the fog, uh, silver shamrock factory. It's a paper pulp factory. So we at least got a legit factory here and to our masks, the infamous Halloween mask. There are three of them. Two of the masks already exist. The skull and the witch. They found them in their prop department. They bring them out for this movie. Uh, Don Post Studio Mask. That's what they were. The pumpkin mask was made exclusively for our movie. So if you like the mask, they were re released in 2014. So no way. if, if I could these... own one piece of movie memorabilia, it would be one of those pumpkin silver shamrock masks. One of the originals. Well, oh, nice. Maybe even a replica, you know, just, just one of them. I'd love to have one in my uh, in my film shed. That and one of the yellow barrels from Jaws, you know, that that, that would be the dream team. Of pop. They do sh- show back up, and I think it was the 2018 Halloween revival, the Danny yeah, McBride. David, I'm sure oh, David, nice. Green loves, David Gordon Green loves Halloween 3, and he even references it in Halloween Ends because the opening titles are, are in blue, which is mm. the same for, for Halloween uh, 3. And yeah, you do see there's some dead kids on a roundabout, I think it is, isn't it? And they're wearing the silver shamrock masks. Yeah, and I believe that there was also an idea that the mask that Michael Myers wears was made by Silver Shamrock, but that was a that was a dropped idea. Ooh, that's evil. That's interesting. I, I like that. That's a good one. I kind of wish we'd revisited that. So, Dan, you you're at least owning the mask. Are you letting your kids wear <laughs> these type masks? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that would be that would be kept like Annabelle in a in a container, you know, in a glass cabinet at the back. <laughs> right. Yes. No one, no one Absolutely, goes. do not touch. Yeah. Yes. Um. Oh yeah, I would love one of those because I I I've, I don't have any tattoos. I've always said I'd only get two or three. I'd have Freddie Mercury on my arm. I'd have the Jaws logo on my arm, and then on my wrist, I'd have the three silver shamrock masks. That's that's nice. all I want. But I'm too much of a chicken to get tattoos. <laughs> That is high praise. Lizzie, are your kids going trick-or-treating in the silver shamrock mess? No, I I don't <laughs> want the smoke. That's anybody that's listened to enough episodes of me on this podcast knows that I'm such a chicken. I love scary movies. I love them so much. They're so much fun. But I I will not. I'm not going to go into the house. 
I'm not going to spend the night in the creepy cemetery. I'm not going to babysit for the creepy people. Like, I don't want the smoke. And so I'm definitely not going to let my kids wear the mask. But I, I think if Wilder was uh, my oldest, if he, when he, because he's eight, so he's too young as well to watch this. But if he became of age and really wanted, you know, got into the idea and wanted one, I'd definitely allow it in the house. But. Oh, no. kids aren't going to trick or treat with it no it's just on display like you said i'm out i'm out uh, a lot of things i will tempt but uh yeah yeah I, I actually had a uh a person that came up and they're like hey can we burn our witchcraft stuff uh, <laughs> on your on your property i'm i'm no longer a witch but can I, we take all your our witchcraft stuff and i'm not an overly superstitious person I'm like nope yeah. Why your got... property? Was it just a random thing? Uh, faith based, of like, hey, you're you're a Christian, and I'm just like, ah, oh. uh, got it. Yeah, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say yes either. I'd be like, again, I don't want the smoke. Like, I don't Wait. keep it away. Like, I yeah. don't want that. I don't yeah, want to go, bite the juju. Go to the, go to the Catholic Church. They train people for that stuff. I don't know, but <laughs> that's right. Like ninety nine percent chance, nothing happens. One percent chance, I'm not taking that. But yeah, there's. I'm not letting my daughter wear these masks, but I'm with Dan. I will do the Annabelle thing. It'll be behind a glass case. Uh, I will test you, test you both here. Horror movie metal. There's a fourth mask in this movie that shows up in the silver shamrock factory. And it's referencing another film. And if you know what film it's from, it kind of gives away the darkness of this movie. Did you catch it? No. I'm trying to think. The skeleton, the witch, and the pumpkin. Pumpkin, yeah. No, There's I didn't. One hanging is, up. Is there a Frankenstein mask? It sort of looks like that. It's got a red bolt. So there it's a white mask with a red, almost like lightning bolt stitching down it. It is from 1981 Strange Behavior. But the alternate title to Strange Behavior is Dead kids i like it oh my gosh so that is what an easter egg yeah white mask with streak of red at the top so next time you revisit this movie check it out it's in the fact in the factory and if you've seen I honestly like it's not a bad movie uh strange behavior is a fun movie it's if you like if you dislike eye things this is again not going to be a movie for you because they really like injecting eyeballs it's ah. Good it's fun. a it's Great. another control type movie where they're basically like chipping people into doing their will. So Okay. Oh goodness. I own it. I haven't seen it. But I do yeah. own it. You own <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right. So that's now making the watch list. It's good. It's I'll good. Check it out. I'll check it out. Our special effects we talked about a little bit. they they were meant with the idea of practical jokes rather than gore i'll be honest though i kind of found the film gory we've got thumbs to the eyeballs we've got exploding heads from the woman at the hotel uh did anything stand out to you like we've got we're drilling someone at one point they yes they drill mm -hmm. the woman at the medical facility the misfire always really stood out to me especially <laughs> when i first watched it like the the way that she, it's like almost like her, her mouth and her whole face is kind of curled outward. Yeah. Yes. And the way that her hands are shaking, that's where the, really what stood out to me. Not the fact, because if they were to show that is just, there was a misfire and now this is what she looks like. I don't think that I would have been really bothered by it. But what bothered me was that she's holding her hands in this very shaky way to show that she is very much alive and she's feeling yeah. the pain yeah. of what is what has happened to her face and then you just you know and then shortly afterwards she dies that part is so creepy to me and it's really really hard to watch because you everybody can understand like on like a grain grain of salt level what it feels like to be in so much pain that you're almost in shock and that like you can you can feel that from her and it's just Ooh, it's hard to watch, but there's a lot of gore in this movie. But honestly, it's so campy that I, I feel like I can forgive it. It's, it's yeah. gross. 
it, it's the sound effects that really make them. I mean, we were talking about the bit where his eyes are taken out and his whole skull is like broken forward. Yes. Really, you know, it's a good effect. But it's the ah, sound of the, the bone snapping. It's like, that's what gets me about it. The other thing about that death, the, uh, the death of Marge in the, the hotel with the misfire, re-watching it, what it does, it also puts into your mind, if that does that and it rips her face up, but only a little spider comes out, what does that do to Buddy's face underneath that mask? Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. That is Absolutely. the biggest face, you know. And you don't even need to see that. You can just, your imagination fills in the rest. Because it whole his whole face just kind of like concaves in and then yeah. falls to the ground. So you can only imagine. And of course, like they had to have that with a mask because like you just you couldn't show that happening to a child. But yeah. you but you're absolutely right. I it, it really does. Like if that's just a misfire, imagine what the real thing looks like. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. It's like deflating a balloon. But it Yes. It, it is strange. Like all the androids, they just go straight for the eyes. Like they're gonna they're going to take you out that way. And that's a very gruesome way compared to uh, Michael Myers. He's lifting people by the neck and stabbing them in the uh-huh. stomach. It's a different kind of brute force. And yeah, ripping a guy's head off, off his shoulders. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if they had seen Terminator. and like, It seems like a short turnaround time because Terminator was, what, 1981? Something like yes. that. Yeah. Where they look at it and say, all right, now our movie's got to have robots in it too. Like <laughs> the, the thing with that eye death for me is that when I first watched it, I didn't know that there was any eye damage. And the, the, the robot does that, and you think, oh, geez, he's going to punch him to death. And then he does that. And you think, yes. oh, God, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, as I said, I've got a real thing about eyes in, in horror films. That one's a bit, that's all right for me because it's not very bloody, except when he wipes the goop on the... <laughs> the curtain um yes but um it's it's still horrific it's still a really horrible death scene every single death in halloween 3 is memorable and unlike the halloween films where oh someone got stabbed you know mm-hmm. yep you know at least at least i remember the deaths from halloween 3 i don't remember the deaths in halloween 4 5 6 you know that's fair yeah it, it's a good most point of, most of those franchises will have maybe one every couple yeah. I think I think of uh, Friday the 13th part 7 with the sleeping bag kill <laughs> but, but I couldn't tell you most of them up to that point in Freddy there's a very specific worm kill or the the yes. first one the, the first bed. one has so many the bed like, yeah all of those are memorable and we do get speaking of memorable we get another John Carpenter soundtrack but this one is very very different i think it's very influenced by the 80s he changes halloween is in a 5-4 piano melody we get a lot of electronic theme here with beeping tonalities that's our silver shamrock that mm-hmm. is the soundtrack memorable apart from the little jingle i think so i mean the that uh when you go back and watch a lot of 80s horror trailers that they use that in um in a lot of eighties trailers, I've I've heard that that piece the the Halloween three title music appear in a lot of other other films for for advertising. I love it. I think it's got that same kind of repetitive like do 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 do. It's got that same kind of um like almost uh what's the word just continuing kind of droning um. You know, almost like an unstoppable kind of force to the uh, to that uh, to that music, and that's what John Carpenter does so well. You know, he does it with all of his his compositions, and I think the fact that it's you know very synthy and electronic just gives it that. You know, it just reflects the the electronic futuristic nature of the story. You know, I don't think if it was a regular orchestrated orchestrated score, it wouldn't have been that. It would have just been another score, but it blends so seamlessly with the ideas and themes of the film. That um, you know, it's all of it's all in one, all of a piece, rather than just a great film with a really memorable soundtrack. You know, mm. I yeah, agree. I, I think, you know, what's so great about Halloween is it really is, especially the first movie. It's just such a simple formula. There's really, I mean, honestly, that's what makes it so attractive. Is this idea? It's not trying too hard. It's just kind of sticking to the basics. And I, I really. 
appreciate that. And the soundtrack is really no different. It's just simple. And I think that that John Carpenter definitely carried that over in the third one, where this story is certainly more complex than the first one, but the soundtrack really stays the same. It stays true to his roots that way, where it's just very simple. There's not too much to it. And like you said, I like the futuristic vibe of it because it feels like it's, um, it's, it, it's almost like, a it's just going along well, really complementing the, the AI of the movie. I, I will make this comparison, but it may be favorable, maybe not, depending on where you land. I happen to love Killer Clowns from Outer Space, and the music <laughs> kind of reminds me of Killer Clowns from Outer Space. It's got almost a whimsy and a fun behind it. Dan's raising his finger. Are you a Killer Clowns from Outer Space Oh, absolutely fan? I am. Absolutely. I love that film. I've thought about bringing it onto the podcast, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid. We have some anti-camp people oh will... believe me i'm british i'm all about the camp you know that's basically <laughs> what our humor is you know our backbone is camp if you want someone to talk about killer clowns from outer space i'll be there definitely oh, anytime Thank yeah you. i'll do it too that'll be fun that'd be a nice third one i'm so bummed that i missed the nightmare on elm street one i was supposed to be on that episode and i had a scheduling conflict so i'm happy that i'm on this one and i'll definitely do killer clowns from outer space the elm, elm street one was really good fun that was yeah it was fun to listen to that was a great episode oh good good I'm I'm just really grateful you guys having me back because I love I love talking about really good films and you know I think Halloween three half <laughs> season of the witch is a really good film. Yes. <laughs> I have to admit the reason why, Chad, you had mentioned earlier that um that you so Dan provided a short list, but then uh, Chad never got to hear it because Russell was just like, We're doing Halloween three season of the witch was because Russell and I were about to record and he was like, Hey, by the way, Dan is gonna come back on. He provided uh, these three movies, and he's got Season of the Witch. I don't know how you feel about that movie. I know it's really polarizing, but I know Chad really likes it. And I was like, I really like it. And he was like, oh, well, oh, that's what we're doing then. And it's just great. So. Yeah, I, th I think Russell asked me to send him my top 100 films list, and I did that, and he just basically, oh, so you've got Halloween 3 in there, very high up. So, like, yeah, that, that will work. I'll do that one. <laughs> yeah. No, so good. Do not, do not feed the crack addict. Do not feed Russell top 100 or whatever lists so he's i owe him homework i think he asked for my top 100 animated features which is very hard to do by mm -hmm. the way because you start running out of good ones about 50 so if you're listening and you want to do this exercise i i dare you like it'll yeah. it, it'll break down into yeah i've seen that and i guess it falls into the 100 but you're really not happy to have that on your list. I've got I've got two animated films in my top twenty. So I hope one is spirited it away. It is not. It is oh. not. No, it's um, the Prince of Egypt. Oh, okay. such a good well, movie. Well, pardon, I've got three. I've got the Prince of Egypt, uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, and the original, uh, the How the Grinch Stole Christmas from 1966. Those are oh, all three yeah. spectacular. I approve of all three of those being in here. Excellent. In your, in your top list, I love them so much. Yeah, no Especially complaints. Especially Prince, so. Prince of Egypt. Prince of Egypt, fantastic movie. film. It's yes, such an amazing good. film. Well, speaking of fantastic films, it's time we give our fantastic comments to this movie. It's our movie superlative time. Dan, we're going to start with you for our MVP for Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Director, actor, supporting actor, something else. What it's have you Dan, got? Dan O'Hurley as Connell Cochran. I, if, if the villain wasn't as memorable or as strong as he is, I think the entire film would have fallen apart. Um, I mm. think I think he he's one of the main reasons why the film is, you know, regarded by people who think of it so highly like ourselves. I think it's his performance that really anchors the film and gives it um, some class, which where the film could easily have gone for just pure exploitation. You know, he's the Donald Pleasance of Halloween one and two for Halloween three, I think. I love it. I love a good villain. I love seeing a good villain get recognized, and he does a fantastic job. Lizzie, who's your MVP? I went with John Carpenter. I think that I appreciate the risk that he took by going in a different route. I think everybody would have so loved to have seen a Halloween 3 with Michael Myers in it, but I, I'm so happy that this movie exists, and I so appreciate that he was willing to take the risk to do so. So, I mean, I've, I've got to give him my, my MVP. I like it. We didn't talk about her very much, but I'm actually going with Stacey Nelkin as Ellie. 
I really liked her performance. She's one of the few that actually receive critical praise for this movie. So Roger Ebert hates this movie, loves her performance. And when she leaves about three quarters of the way through this movie, I really, really miss her. Mm -hmm. I like that dynamic, even though she's got some weird 80s trope lines of old enough or whatever. She's just a fun dynamic. I love the scene she's in. The Android thing at the end is a throwaway, I I guess. I when I start thinking about that, I'm like, why didn't she <laughs> stop him in the factory? Why didn't she why did she wait till this moment? Whatever. She's great. Best supporting actor, Dan. Yes, it would be Stacey Nelkin. I think I think she's really terrific in the film. I, it could have been very much a eighties horror female, poorly written role. No, but she's not given the best lines of dialogue, you know, that you know. I'm old enough, don't worry, or whatever she yeah. says. Yeah. <laughs> terrible line. But she, you know, she she comes into it, you know, with the seriousness and she seems to be genuinely invested in the story. And, you know, I think I think the twist of her being an android at the end is actually a really good one. And her performance when she's acting as the as the robot and she's got like the whatever it is, caramel syrup coming out of her mouth or whatever, she looks genuinely like stunned by her own fate. You know, I, th- I think I think it's a good performance by by Stacey Elkin, and yeah, I can see why it was one of the uh, few elements that were were praised. Lizzie, who who's your pick? This is when I put Colonel Cochran. I think that he did such a great job, and I'm I think we're all in agreement that a good villain really makes or breaks a movie, and I think he just did a fantastic job. So fun to watch, and um, yeah, he just he really really made he elevated the film for me. Yeah, Connell's so charming. He's my pick as well. If it weren't for the whole killing kids part, I'd be rooting for him. <laughs> right? like, like, come up with a different plot. I'm probably on your side cheering you on. Like, <laughs> you go, you crazy old Irish dude. But yeah, it's, it's a bridge too far, but he makes it seem reasonable. So, Dan O'Hurley, good job. There's a bunch of hidden gems to pick out in this movie movie dan i i'm interested to hear what'd you pick out i really like the character of teddy the 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 uh the nurse working alongside daniel chalice and he phones her every so often to see what's going on and he, she's filtering through the pieces of um of the robot which she doesn't realize is a robot at first and she yes. really like that that character and there's there often comes up lists of the uh, you know worst you know unfair character deaths or whatever and i think i think she suffers just as bad as you know the silver shamrock victims you know the fact she gets a drill to the temple um i i think she really makes it uh for the small amount of time she's on screen i think she makes a really good impression and um, i really like seeing them and daniel chalice talking together she actually got injured during that scene too because the stuntman missed and got what? her hair so the stuntman injured her by getting the drill stuck in her hair. And and so that wow. leads into my hidden gem. So sorry to skip you, Lizzie, but oh Tommy my- Lee Wallace is the dude that's over top of her doing the drilling because she got injured before. The stunt stuntman paid to do it. <laughs> oh skip. my gosh. I am shooketh. That is That's horrible. That is awful. I mean, I can almost ugh. When my kids like pull my hair, I am like in agony. I can't even imagine. Oh my goodness, it's awful. Lizzie, what's your hidden gem? My hidden gem is that they play Halloween in the background of like somehow it's in the same Halloween universe. I always think it's funny and kind of charming how they're like, and now, you know, like right leading up to the special event, we're going to be playing Halloween one and two. And it's, It's interesting, kind of um, almost a little meta that they do that. And it makes me question, you know, we had said that that they wouldn't necessarily live in the same universe in the world, in a world where John Carpenter was to make a fourth Halloween that had nothing to do with any of the previous films. They, You're absolutely right, Dan. They couldn't make a reference to the events in, in California before, but they definitely... I'd be interested to see how they would play on that, maybe just because of how they play on one and two. I think I think they probably would have done it the way the screen movies use the stab series, the fictional stab series. Oh Um, yes, yes. They in in uh, they're in universe stories that were told, whereas the Halloween films one and two 
were films that were were big successes in the Halloween universe. If, if you can see what I mean, that's a really it's a really complicated yes. way of putting it. But I know what you mean. If if the if Halloween one could appear as like a little an Easter egg or something to link them all together um, as siblings or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a really good comparison. I bet that they would do that. Yeah, we get the movie twice, and then we get that little Michael Myers type shot when the mask is over top of the camera. Mm-hmm. So that's a cool. And I I love the story that happened behind that behind the scenes with that. Tommy Lee Wallace did it the first time. Like he just threw the mask on the camera the first time. But when it was Tom Adkins' job to do it, <laughs> it took twenty some takes to get that to stick. So Tommy Lee Wallace was like, this is no big deal. It won't take very long. Tom Adkins is having trouble getting that shot. But it's a, it's a neat little <laughs> I like that. Halloween moment. Who are you recasting in this film, Dan? Oh, that's a really hard question. That's a really hard... I'd recast the dummy at the end that poses as Carl Cochran's death, <laughs> death body. Uh, you know, as it's vaporized by Stonehenge. That's that for me is the one special effect that really doesn't work for me. Right it's like a digging. running theme for us of dummies at the end of movies. Oh yeah, we like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, on Elm Street. Mom's legs going through the door in Nightmare. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I'll never forget the first time I watched that. I yeah. think I think like that actually. That's a good comparison because it sort of ends the film. That ends that character's arc on a bit of a dud note because you want to see Carl Cock and get his comeuppance, and you know he's going to be killed in this spectacular way, and then it's this weird looking figure that doesn't really look like Dan O'Hurley, he um, grinning. You know um, that that would be something that I'd I'd maybe have given a second go on. Rather okay. Than, uh, I don't think we've ever recast a dummy, but I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm here for it. Lizzie, who are you recasting? So this might be a little mean, and so I apologize in advance to Tom Atkins. I really do like Daniel Chalice. I like the character, but to me, Tom Atkins, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, but Tom Atkins to me seems like a poor man's Tom Selleck. So for <laughs> me, I'm, I'm replacing him with Tom Selleck. I think that he would do a really interesting job. And I think what Tom Selleck could do perhaps really well is bring a little more softness to Dr. Chalice. I think Mm. that he definitely would have that ladies man suaveness that Tom Atkins has, but I think that there's perhaps a little bit more likability to Tom Selleck. And I, I I would be interested to see him in this. I don't think he's ever been in a a horror movie is I've no, at least I have none that I've seen. So it'd be kind of interesting to see him take on something different. Yeah, no, I can't think of him in a horror film, actually. I like it. I I went after Tom Adkins, too, but mine is just because they tell me he's a medical professional, and I don't believe it. <laughs> Again, it's like casting detective. Meg Ryan as a helicopter pilot. It's like yeah. <laughs> right. Tom Selleck, now that's a doctor. That's a doctor. Yeah. That's right. So, you know, I am sticking Jeff Daniels in the role. I feel like Ooh, Jeff Daniels. I like that. He's a great actor. He really is. He he would do a great job with that. See, I was thinking moving forward into John Carpenter's career, uh, young Jeff Bridges. Not Jeff Bridges, Kurt Russell. Beg your pardon. Yeah. Ooh, that would be really good too. He he reminds me, he has a lot of the same charm, I think. He'd Mm -hmm. be able to bring a lot of that like Tom Selleck softness to it as well. And I think with Jeff Jeff Daniels, he would do like he'd built he'd almost bring like a lightness to it, I think. Yeah, I like that. I'm in for all of these universes. <laughs> yeah. New new dummies and, and Tom <laughs> Selleck. And all all different Jeff types of, of Tom Atkins. And, and some of them the kids live. So <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> best shot, Dan. The best shot. The it's the shot of the kids uh, trick or treating on Halloween night. The Dean Cundy's uh, cinematography there is just beautiful with the, the with the, the blood red sun setting behind them. I think it really, it's weird, but when I think of the first Halloween film, I don't think of it as a seasonal Halloween film. To me, that's a <laughs> film that I could watch any time of the year. But Halloween 3 feels so much more like a, a seasonal film. It feels so much like it's just embedded in that time of year. 
And I think Dean Cundy's cinematography, especially in that part where the kids are going around in the masks and, you know, some of them have got like a witch's, uh, uh, a fairy costume on, but wearing the witch's mask and they've sort of swapped and changed them just to, you know, to however look they want. That to me really feels like Halloween and the, the cinematography there, the, especially the way the sunset looks behind them is just amazing. And it really reflects the poster as well, which I like. Agreed. Great shot. Great pick. Lizzie, what's yours? That was mine as well. I just think it's it's the classic. It's what you think about when you see it. But for me, what makes it so powerful is that, um, you know, to your point, Dan, like it's just so classically Halloween. And we know everything at this point. Like we know that these kids are in for a, a fate worse than death if you if if you could even call it that since they will eventually <laughs> succumb to death. But yeah. it is uh, it is just it's so eerie because you're taking something like Halloween that as we know it is just so light and fun and in these happy children and we know what they're in for and so the scene itself is beautiful but it's also really haunting because we know what what is about to happen when the clock strikes nine yeah oh look at all the fun they're having and oh it's like watching Charlie Brown Halloween you know great pumpkin and then suddenly Jason Voorhees appears at the end. You're like, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> well, yeah. fine. You're All supposed right. to be watching him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do kind of get that way. So detour the story. I did this with 28 Days Later. I I got my wife, wife to sit down and watch it. And I had seen it several times. And we got past the zombies to when they encountered the, the human base, the military mm-hmm. base. And I just looked at my wife and I said, you don't know what's about to happen, but I do and I can't do it tonight. (laughs) She has never seen past the movie, but I just couldn't take that darkness. Just just talk about, I mean, talking about eyeball trauma in a film. God, 28 days later, awful for that. The sequel's (laughs) even worse. 28 weeks later has got the worst eye gouging in any any horror film I've ever seen. Mm, That's a movie I stopped. I've never finished it either. Never watched it. That is brutal. Truth or Dare, uh, very innocuous title, but uh, razor blade to eyeball. Yeah, I do remember that terrible film, but I do remember that razor blade across. The <laughs> I remember that movie too. I think about that every now and again when I'm in a pool and I have to hold my breath for a long time. I think about that movie and how the the barrel scene and mm-hmm. so that movie ended so sadly. What a sad movie! <laughs> what a like what a strange terrible movie. Right. All of us have distinct <laughs> memories of. Uh, my best shot is all the, I don't even know if you can call them scientists, but they're all dead at the time. And they're dead in a circle. Yeah. And the monitors are flashing red and black and we're getting the tonalities playing. And it's this overhead shot. It's just, it's very dark, creepy, and still kind of fun house esque. I don't know how else to describe it, but it's it's a wonderful shot for me. And I just really enjoyed it. I like that shot because it, it sort of plays into the ritual um, that that Connell Cochran was doing, the way they're laid out in that perfect circle, as you say, the way the bodies are arranged. It seems to be very deliberate kind of uh, sacrificial um, posing that they've, they've yeah. done there. I do, I do love that shot and the way the, the blue starts spinning around faster and faster around them, around the, the monitor. Yes. It's a great shot. Best scene, Dan, what's your favorite? Oh, that's really hard to pick because there's so many standout scenes. I love, I do love the introduction of Connell Cochran, where they're all like, oh, no, it's no problem, friends. She's been taken to the factory, you know, and that sort of thing. You're like, Who, what is this guy about? Why is he, why has he got a medical facility at the factory? You know, um, but the one that I really love, because it's just so bonkers and has no place in the story whatsoever, is when Daniel Chalice has gone into the factory to find Ellie, and he goes into that room where there's a knitting grandmother. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. Why is that there? And it's then, like, this is an artifact from, yeah. <laughs> and then, and then he knocks the head off, and he goes, oh, and then Connell Cochran goes, that was one of my favourites. And you're like, right. <laughs> do you have that just in a cupboard? You know, you crazy man. I do love that moment. It's so, it's so, so strange. In my head canon, he's built a robot of his grandmother. Like that's Aww. that's his Norman. Oh. I, I'm taking a Norman Bates route. Today. That's very Norman Bates. <laughs> yes, but very believable. Lizzie, what's your favorite scene? 
It's so ridiculous that it has to be my favorite scene. So when I first watched this, I was totally surprised at the reveal that Ellie is now uh, an android. And I just, I think that entire scene is absolutely hilarious. What it makes me think of is the very first Austin Powers movie where Austin Powers is fighting one of these bad guys. And there's this like, every single time he thinks he's defeated him, he just keeps coming back. And then he finally just asks him straight up, like, why won't you die? And like, to <laughs> me, that just like reminds me so much of it because Ellie just, robot Ellie just continues to come back. And every time it's just crazier and crazier and more ridiculous. And it is truly the most ridiculous part of that movie, in my opinion. But that's probably why I like it because the first time I watched it I could not stop laughing and now I just have this it holds a place in my, in my Halloween 3 heart never, so I, I never, love it I'd never thought of Austin Powers but yeah you're absolutely right when he's trying to <laughs> Will Ferrell's character and he just he just won't die um, the, um, <laughs> for me it's very evil dead especially you know the seven yes. I'm trying to choke him and things and him, and then the, the headless body just goes running around like that yeah, it's, it's very daft that's a great comparison too. Yes, that's. I will watch the old Evil Dead's because they're so campy. I watched the first remake. I don't think I have the guts to watch the second one. Talking about human Ooh. suffering, I don't know if I'm if I'm in the for that one. The problem with the first one was it lost any of the humor that made the first three Evil Dead. Right. Movies. Yes. The second one, Evil Dead Rise, was in my favorite films of last year because that was a really funny film. It, it was okay. It was, Maybe I'll give it a shot then. It was like it was like early Peter Jackson, you know, like Bad Taste or Brain Dead. It just went so far with the gore that it became really, really funny. Oh, um, okay. Whereas, oh. yeah, I'm not a fan of that Fede Alvarez. We all make my husband watch it first and then judge it. He really knows my limits like better oh. than anybody else. So maybe I'll have him watch it. But I, the first one. I was out like pretty early on. I was like, this is just too much for me. There's a scene involving a cheese grater, which is awful. <laughs> Any Ooh, gosh, yeah. So uh, yeah, be, be careful with that. But I think I, I love Evil Dead Rise. I thought it was great. Proper return to form for the series. Um, sorry to go on a deviance about other people. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no I, that, that's what we're here for. We're all movie nerds. We love it. Evil Dead is probably one of the best, if not the most consistent horror franchises. I, I love the remake. Or I guess it's not even a remake, but the newer one, and I loved Rise. I didn't find it funny. I, I'm oh, not remembering the funny. I, I'll Especially have... that end with like what that 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 grinder thing, that wood chipper thing. That was yes. ridiculous. Okay, okay. That, well, I, I found that very funny. I, really... I need to watch that again now because I'm remembering the horrific things, and there are some tough oh, things some to get to. Uh, really is. But, It'll be interesting. Yes, Lizzie, have that pre-screen. I was going to say, I'm going to have Aaron watch that first. I'm like one up. of our kids. Like, we have to watch it first before you can Oh, yeah, watch. yeah. No, don't, don't show it to the kids. Definitely. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. Not at all. Oh, not at all. But we, yeah. now that Wilder's 8, will like, he, he wants, the big one that he really wants to watch is Transformers the movie with Shia LaBeouf. And we're yeah. like, we have to rewatch that because I, because we, we tend to watch the movies ahead of time. To determine if he's prepared yeah and um so it's i'm just saying i'd be like the child role in that movie with with evil dead i will be interested i i am on the side of this is not a lizzie movie but i would be fast <laughs> tell us what aaron says afterwards that would yes be i will uh for my best scene i'm a big invasion of the body snatchers either original or or the 70s version love both of them so i love the the loot Allusion to that movie, the homage to the movie of having Dr. Chalice just yelling, stop it, stop it, stop yeah. it, instead of you're next, you're next. He doesn't do it as well as Kevin McCarthy, but knowing the implication, I, it's not open-ended to me. So I, I think that's just an awesome scene to just fade to black. At. It's an awesome scene. Best wardrobe or makeup moment, Dan? <laughs> it is when Ellie is... Um when he sees the android because even though the effects of like the circuitry going crazy in her arms i really do <laughs> like it for its for its naffness uh the um the death of marge though is is really horrific that i mean the way her whole face is just split open um, yes. that, that's a really horrible image and i think tom berman the makeup artist did a really good job with making it grotesque but not gory 
Do you know what I mean? It's it's a really yes. it's it's not a splatter fest like some of the later Halloween films, but it it, it is a gruesome film. You know, it yeah. is it is it's a film that's really unpleasant to watch at times, um, without going too far. Um, so I, th- I think all the makeup work in the film, but that yeah that that scene with Marge and the way that spider makes its way around and bends into her head, it, that's probably my favourite makeup moment. Because it's, it's the first proper shocking death of the film and it really shows you what these masks are going to do. Yeah, agreed. The word I wrote down was gnarly. I think mm. that gets to, <laughs> gets to what we're talking about. Of it, It's gruesome but not gory. Lizzie, what's your best wardrobe or makeup? You know, I, I feel like all of the usually with these like androids, I always liked the, I guess the quote, like blood that these androids have, like it's a like, gooey. Mm-hmm. And I, for whatever reason, it always makes my stomach turns, but I have to give it really to them because there's something that turns my stomach whenever I watch it. And I find it. And of course it like plays along with the camp and I, I don't know. I, I, it seems so simple, but for whatever reason, it really, kind of grosses me out I almost find it equally as gruesome as some of the deaths and I think for that like it's just kind of like sometimes even just as simple as it's spilling out of their mouths and I I just have to give it to them for I guess getting the right composition of of the goo (laughs) they did a great job okay Uh, right coagulation of (laughs) yes (laughs) I'm I'm in the Dan camp Marge, I wrote down exploding head lady. It's goofy. Her the laser looks goofy, but the cook skull, that's just a really gnarly effect. So Yes. Mm-hmm. Change one thing. And we all like this movie, but I think we're all recognizing there are some flaws. What are you changing to fix this? Or make it better? For me personally, it would be the relationship between Chalice and Ellie. I think that that 180 where he suddenly comes in and she's suddenly just in that really skimpy lingerie. It's like, yes. where does this come from? And he, <laughs> that, and he says that line, of, oh, I think I'll go and book a hotel. And he, she says, where do you want to sleep, Dr. Chalice? That's yes. the question, Miss Grimbridge. It's like, that's a, that's really bad writing. Yeah. You know, and I know, I know, I mean, the film's credited to Tommy Lee Wallace, but it was actually written, it was, number of rewrites. The original rewrite was by a guy called Nigel Neal, who's really well known in this country, for writing a lot of classic science fiction TV shows like uh, Quatermass and uh, things like that. And um, I think I think that the way that the film was passed over from the British sensibilities to the American sensibilities, I think something got lost in translation with the character motivations at that point. So I really, that, that, oh, that scene, that sex scene with Ellie, Ellie and Dan when he says how old are you is that is so 80s yes you know that would that would never fly today and I think I think it it's show I've seen the film in a public screening and that moment always gets a huh right. just a massive question mark appears above the audience's heads um so I would change that I'd, I'd try and level out the relationship between Ellie and and Dan Chalice it's like they forgot really they, they had a good or really a great female character, and they just kind of revert back to the 80s trope of, well, she's got to be an object of yeah, uh, you know, sexual conquest. And like, she, she's not exactly paper thin. She has a motivation. She's got a family member that was dead. She has her own yeah. reasons. It does detriment to good... her character. Yeah. It Agreed. Does. They should really keep in it for her. From being a strong leading female, you know, with agency and a real motivation, to just another 80s bombshell, you know, you know, who men are really looking forward to seeing in a very skimpy lingerie. Right. You know. Yep. That's a good one. Lizzie, what are you changing? I really like that one that you did, Dan. I I wanna know how like to me, I think the Stonehenge piece is confusing. <laughs> like yes. I think they <laughs> I, I think there could have been a much more simplistic way that the masks work you know if he technically colonel cochran is a is a warlock i suppose so maybe there's some kind of dark magic or spell or something that he's concocted to get it with the masks but i just feel like it feels like such a cop-out to have stonehenge and then just to have the throwaway line of 
you wouldn't believe how we got it here. Because <laughs> it's such, it's such, you know, it's such narrative wallpapering of what, what you know. Yeah, yes. it makes sense. We're not even going to try and explain it. Just go along. <laughs> it's so, you, and it, because the movie. The, yeah, the movie is so campy that already, that, like, you really do forgive it. But in my mind, I'm like, okay, let's maybe just, like, take that out. Because I right. you really, you know that you've backed yourself into a corner with this Stonehenge thing. And at okay. some point, the writers were like, we need to somehow explain this. You know what? We're just going to put this one line in here. And that's going to be all we need. And it's going to be fine. <laughs> the thing that bothers me about that Stonehenge thing, if you take a look at it at the end when Connell Cochran is defeated and supposedly all the masks have gone out for the children of America, very little of Stonehenge has been carved out. Yeah. There's like three or four gashes <laughs> yes. in the side of it and the rest of it's standing perfectly fine. Uh, I thought that you'd need a bit more, you know, <laughs> particles to, to do that. Right. Yeah, either Stonehenge is much bigger than what I remembered or, you know, they're... They're taking little tiny pebbles from it. It's certainly bigger than the one in Spinal Tap, that's for sure. Mm. <laughs> Love it. I, For me, I'm going a, a little bit more extreme. Uh, Lizzie's taking out Stonehenge. I think that's silly, and I agree. I'm going to drop the entire Android thing, even though I said I do like Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I feel like this film's doing too much. I feel like you can have an evil cult sacrificing children on Halloween without also adult replacement like pick a lane and kill whomever either replace the adults or kill the children you don't have to do both simultaneously this is why he failed because he's just doing too much so i can i can see that working because you could still have the name santa mira and you could still have you know the stop it at the end you know the reference to invasion of the body snatchers without it being so overtly a you know a riff on invasion of the body snatchers I can see, yeah, I can, I could take the androids out. I'd be, I'd be fine with that. But then we'd miss out on the lovely consistency of the goop, you know, that causes lists. Yes. Kind of yep. Yeah, and I don't know what you do with Ellie at the end because I think her character is just doomed from the beginning. Yeah. But, you know, uh, we'll, we'll figure it out along the way. <laughs> best, best quote, as you said, there's, there's some great uh, British dialogue here from. Uh, you said is Nigel. Uh, he's the one that had his Nigel Neal. his name. Yeah, he had his name removed from yes. the film. Yeah. So, anything that uh, you know that he wrote that you're picking? Not, not that I'm aware of. Supposedly, according there's a documentary that's on on YouTube that the Shout Factory commissioned. It's called Stand Alone: The Making of Halloween Three: Season of the Witch. And Tommy Lee Wallace talks about that sole writing credit that he gets, and actually about sixty percent of the original idea was Nigel Neal's, and a lot of it was kept intact but i do i my, my favorite line is that we had a time getting it here you wouldn't believe us if we told you because <laughs> it's it's almost like a comic book villain line yes it's, it's 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 such it's so preposterous but it matches the tone of the rest of the film you know it does it, that, that's too much but you know heads exploding and androids with caramel coming out of their mouths is too much then you know, it's 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 not. It's just an extra layer of cheese on that lovely little lasagna of a film. You know? <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. You wouldn't believe how we got it here. Be like, well, I'd like to hear how. Like, I'd like. Right. To... <laughs> <Why> <laughs> yeah, expand on that a little bit for me. <laughs> Lizzie, what's your best quote? I love Colonel Cochran's. Um, I do love a good joke, and this is the best ever a joke on the children. It's just chilling. Mm. It is. It's the only time, really, that he feels scary to me in in a true villain way. I mean, he, of course, for all the reasons that we've previously mentioned, he is such an amazing villain. But that's when almost like his the facade is just fully dropped in that scene, and he's no longer interested in being trying to to charm him. Like the jig is up now, and he can be completely honest with Daniel Chalice and um, it's it's a very eerie line and of course as we've discussed it's the idea that the target is children is just mm -hmm. so evil and so dark and I think it's a really cool choice for the filmmakers yeah. to go from a completely silent killer Michael Myers who doesn't say a thing except for heavy breathing to this really eloquent guy who's got a real yeah. behind his madness I think I think that provides such a great contrast to the rest of the Halloween series. You know, you've got this, you've got the, you know, Michael Myers who's got a big body count, but Connell Cochran, he's got a much bigger body count than any other slasher villain combined. 
you know. He does, yeah. He killed an entire population of kids. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah, that's a good point. I like that. Make menacing lines, Lizzie, but I, the one that stuck out to me, the really menacing one that was promptly ruined, is Chalice saying, why, Cochrane, why? And Cochrane responds with, do I need a reason? Mm-hmm. And it's just yes. like, oh, that's fantastic. I, I love that. And then he gives a reason. Yeah. Of, and it makes it worse. Of Oh, yeah, the Irish have done this for centuries. Mm-hmm. My family is Irish. No, we haven't. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is this is unhelpful. <laughs> so, so uh, back to the anti-Irish, anti-children, anti-television, yes. anti-capitalism. Uh, fascinating film. So before we give rankings and ratings for this fascinating film, Dan, can you tell us one more time where we can get more from you? Yes, of course. If you go to Dunkirk Movie Reviews on Facebook, if you type that in the search bar, you'll find my... Uh, my review page on there. I, I upload fairly regularly. I do collection updates um, every month, and then I do I talk about all the films. Well, I try to talk about all the films that I watch. I've been doing a run of all the uh, best picture winner uh, nominees um, and uh, all sorts. So I, I try to keep on top of all the releases, but with two kids, it's impossible. <laughs> so a lot, a lot of my reviews um, are mostly streaming releases and things. Um, and you can also follow me on Letterbox Dan Cook Twenty One where I do an entire schedule of everything that I watch uh, every day. Because I've got some work to do on my Oscar movies. I've seen Barbie, and that's it. So, okay. So Oppenheimer next, maybe. Hold on. Yeah. That's the one you need to watch. Hold Overs and Killers of the Flower Moon. They're the best. Uh, mm, okay. I really right. want to see Killers of the Flower Moon, but I just don't know if I have three and a half hours of my life that I can devote to it. I right. <laughs> it's really long. I, I sorry, I split it over two days, and that was, oh, okay. that seems perfect. That's probably what I need to do. Yeah, yeah. If it's not named Lord of the Rings, it is not getting three and a half hours. <laughs> of my I'm with you there. I'm with you there. All right, Dan. Ratings and recommendation time. This was your pick. Zero to five stars, half star increments. You've been going to bat hard for this movie. Yeah. What are you giving Halloween three? I give, I give this four stars. I really do love this film, and I wish it would be a, a film that people would give a real chance to. Um, it's hard it's hard to recommend it to people who are such big fans of the Halloween franchise because it is so radically different. But if you're looking for something that you've never seen before, and you're just looking for a really strange, weird, cult, 80s horror film, then Hall- Halloween 3 Season of the Witch is right up there for me. Absolutely. Lizzie, what are you giving Halloween 3? I went with 4.5 stars and wow. honestly really just because I like it. You know, the half star the that I've left off is just because of the fact that I can appreciate the gaps that it has and, and the reasoning behind why it doesn't have as much notoriety as, as I think it should. But I just really like this movie. This is, to me, is something that every Halloween I want to watch. And I just, for what it is, I think it's perfection and all of its imperfection and so i i just i have a great time when i watch it i just love it i i do apologize i've just realized on my letterbox i did give this four and a half stars so okay there we go twinsies there we go there we go all right well i come in at four stars and i everything you guys have said is i'm right there with you i really really enjoy this film i recognize like i said at the beginning I, I'm not sure it's a good film, but it's a film I enjoy. It's a film I would recommend. Mm-hmm. And that's that's something for me. I love Critters. Critters yeah. is by no means a good film. I'm still going to recommend it to people. You're going to have a good time. So I'm with Dan. I wish people would give this a second chance. Throw out the Michael Myers stuff. Who cares? Just Exactly. Who yeah. cares? Yeah. Call it Season of the Witch if it makes you happier. Agreed. And you'll have a good time. Wild time, fun time. Watch it. Watch it back to back with uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Now that's a double bill. That's a double bill. (laughs) There we go. But we do have to get a little bit more serious. So, Lizzie, you want to help me pick a movie for next time? Yes, yes, I do. So, as uh, we've got a theme for next week. And as Frank Sinatra once sang, my kind of town Chicago is. So the theme is going to be the city of Chicago. 
So option number one, we have high fidelity from 2000. During Prohibition, Treasury agent Elliot Ness sets out to stop ruthless Chicago gangster Al Capone and assembles a small, incorruptible team to help him. Option number two, Ferris Bueller's Day Off from 1986. A popular high school student admired by his peers decides to take the day off from school and goes to extreme lengths to pull it off due to, his, uh, due to the charging of his dean, who will do anything to stop him. You know what? I don't need a, a third option because we need to revisit some of these teen great comedies from the 80s. I think they, they provoke interesting questions. They, it's fun to revisit. We did Breakfast Club. We're going to do Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Don't even nice. need a third option. So Fantastic choice. Nice. Good. Right. I look forward to listening to that because I hate Matthew Bodrick. Ooh. 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 You know, we also just watched um, the show. Oh, my goodness. Oh, True Detective, the yeah. season, season three. It was fantastic. If you guys haven't watched it, you really should give it a watch. But Ferris Bueller's Day Off was like in the background consistently oh, throughout oh, okay. that movie. It's a nice little Easter egg. I'm not on that episode. I have some strong feelings about Ferris. And you know what? I'll just put it out there. He's a terrible friend. Yes, he a is. Terrible friend. Yes. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. He is. I forget his friend's name with the cool car, but he does not yeah. Cameron. deserve him. Cameron. Right. Cameron does. Cameron is way too good of a friend to him. I mean, he pressures him. He's not nice. I could go on a tangent about that as well. I really look forward to listening to that because I, <laughs> I, I can't stand Matthew Bodrick. So I look forward to seeing what you guys say about him. Hot takes. Russell will be much kinder to this movie. Russell's a Russell's a fan. But you know what? We are fans of you, Dan. Thank you oh, very much very for kind joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And um, yeah, if you want to talk Killer Clowns from Outer Space, I'd be more than happy to do that. Yes, oh yeah, I'd yes. be down. This was really fun. Yes, we will make that happen in October. Send Russell an email. He's our scheduler. Wonderful. He will, uh, thank you. He will set it up. That would be great. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you, all the lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We want you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. So subscribe, rate, review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Pandora, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Give us a like on Facebook, on Instagram, or Twitter. Twitter is at movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. And hey, producing and providing this podcast is fun, but it is not free. So we would like you to send us some money at patreon.com slash retromovieroundtable. Any contribution is much appreciated. It goes towards making the show better for you, the listeners. As always... Thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Lizzie? Oh, look, another glorious morning makes me sick.